Welcome to the Humans of Hospitality podcast. I know so many of you listening to this show love your local bar, your local restaurant, maybe your local hotel, and have so many fond memories of time in hospitality businesses. This is the podcast where we get to chat to the human beings behind the scenes of that industry. Maybe the chefs or the bakers or the coffee roasters or the gin distillers or the craft brewers or the entrepreneurs, but all doing an amazing job of making sure the hospitality stays interesting and the big dull formulaic brands do not take over our high street please enjoy the show This week, I was exceptionally excited to sit down with the legendary Michelin-starred chef, Alex Aitken. Now imagine this, you're about to open your first restaurant to the public, your wife who's working front of house is eight and a half months pregnant, you're the chef and you've never cooked professionally before, but you buy a couple of recipe books and some chef whites and off you go. Sounds utterly bonkers, doesn't it? But yes, that is what Alex Aitken did in 1983. And it was the start of a Michelin-starred career which has evolved in incredible ways and is still going very strong. Today, Alex is spreading his love of locally sourced food, whether foraged, fished or farmed, through a growing number of award-winning restaurants carrying the Jetty name. And as you will hear, his passion for sourcing food sustainably harks back to his teenage years as a deck hand on North Sea trawlers. He's got some hair-raising tales of mistaking World War II mines for bumper catches and a mischievous tale about why he likes fiddling with the music volume while you're eating your dinner in his hotel restaurants. It's only a bit of fun, but I very much hope you enjoy this week's fascinating conversation with Alex. Perfect. Alex Aitken, thank you so much for sparing the time to be on the podcast. Much appreciated. Can you just explain where in the world are we? Just set the scene a little bit, geographically. Well, geographically, we're on the Dorset coast in the suburb of Motherford, which is a suburb of Christchurch. So right next to the water's edge. We are. Very beautiful. We've just had a coffee literally overlooking the ocean. It's quite a warm day, or overlooking the harbour at least. So thank yeah. you very much. It's a, it's a cracking spot. How long have you been involved here? Oh, I came here. I was asked that question earlier earlier in the day, actually, so I know exactly. It was August 2010. August 2010, so... Yeah. Uh, eight, nine years. Yeah, nine years, nine yeah. years. Perfect, good. So I very much want to come to um, to what you're doing now. Uh, firstly, you know, thanks for taking the time because you've had an incredible career. Uh, so I want to go back to the beginning and just kind of, you know, join a few dots as to, as to how we've ended up here. Um, how did it start for you? I've read a little bit about fishing trawlers and you being a naughty boy and ended up in Scotland. Was that your first That's, involvement with food? Um, I suppose my first involvement involvement with food that I really remember. It's probably my childhood when I was, for three years we were in Singapore. Father was in the Royal Air Force. Right. So we had three years living in Singapore and I think subliminally that's what turned me on to food because it was just amazing. But then when we came back things went a bit wayward and I got a job pot washing um, in a little restaurant in Romsey when I was 13. Too young to work but yeah. And then they started to make me a waiter so I remember then serving all the wines at this 100 cover restaurant. Not, well, I was a big, not at 13 by this yeah, time. Yeah, was you, really, really? Wow. I was a big lad. Okay. I was, yeah, 36 foot tall then. Wow. And um, they, they were caught or I was caught. And so I was told I wasn't able to do that anymore. Okay. And then I was that, um, when I was 15, I was sent up to uh, Scotland to take me away from the personalities I was enjoying. So I started at my father's residence, which was in uh, Edinburgh. And uh, it was boring. And so I went to my, where my mother came from, which was Dunbar, which is this cute little fishing village um, just outside of Edinburgh, about 40 miles along the Firth of Forth. And so I wasn't bored. I asked if I could go out on a trawler because I love the sea. I absolutely adore the sea. I've sailed for many years in dinghies. And so I went out just as a, a little lad getting in the way, really. But I wanted to do something. So I was allowed to then join in sorting the fish. And then the next couple of days I was helping shoot the nets away. And I was due to go back to school. And uh, the, the three crew members each had to have a two weeks off holiday. And they asked me to cover for them. And so I thought school or work on a fishing trawler for an extra six weeks. <laughs> and I was earning, this is a long time ago, we'd have to work it out, but it must be... Uh, not quite 50 years ago, um, but 45 years ago. And I was earning 200 pound a week. 
Um, so yeah, more than you'd have got at school. Far more than I'd have got at school. <laughs> so I, I stayed and did it. And then as soon as I finished my education, I just jumped straight on the train and back up to a Scotland and did a couple of years working full time as a deckhand on a trawler. Oh, really? Yeah, out into the North Sea. And we fished for lots of different things. And also my uncles and that were in the fishing trade. So I'd be some days out, you know, just simply potting for crab and lobster, you know, fishing for bait, so mackerel and things like that. Or it'd be on the big trawler, big, it was only sort of 50, 60 feet. But we'd be out trawling for prawns. You'd do a, a dusk and day, then early morning trawl. So you'd go out at dusk, trawl for the prawns, bring them on board, sort them into small, medium and large, sort any bycatch out as well, then have some supper, switch on the trawling lights and just let the boat drift all around the Firth of Forth, hoping that anything was going to hit you would be noisy enough to wake you up. I, mean, I used to worry about that because we never didn't have sort of duties where we'd have to be on watch, right. but we just knew the boat wouldn't move that far and we didn't anchor up or anything. Wow. Then in the morning we woke up and then another trawl and those were over very soft grounds um, but very good for prawns at certain times of the year then another occasion it was fishing with what they call bobbins which are like big steel balls that are at the bottom of the net that will bounce over rocks and so you're fishing rough ground and that was the hardest work because you're you're heaving your nets every every hour to two hours because you don't know what damage has happened and you could be just trawling around and everything's falling out the back of the net and on those rough grounds we also went over the scariest part of being on the trawler was when we one you come fast and the boat starts getting dragged backwards underwater um, and the other one was you'd think you've got a big catch and you look over the side it's one of those world war ii mines you know about sort of six foot tall six foot wide with spikes sticking out and it's banging against the side of the boat wow and you just the, the skipper or someone leans over cuts it free ties a boy to it and and then, and then, then you, you move out the way. You, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you literally move out the way very quickly because okay, if so it hits the bottom, it could go yeah. off. Did that ever happen? And that never happened to us. Now, most wow. of them are dormant, but you Gosh. never know. There was a, one of the sister boats in Dunbar Harbour did come in shore. And when they dropped the net, well, opened the cod end, which is the bottom of the net, when they opened it, um, they thought they had a big boulder in there and they put fish boxes down to stop the impact. Then picked the prawns and the catch like you would normally then thought, that shape looks a bit regular. 500 pound of TNT torpedo warhead. Wow. And they brought it into the dock. Really? And they were first thing they were told goodness. was, get out. And yeah. um, that was quite impressive seeing that be, um, they attached something to it, lifted it off, dropped it down and blew it up. And Who's this, the fisherman the, or did the MOD no, get involved they, they at this point? The MOD I can't this point. Yeah, I think that was, was a bit yeah, using was their initiative. Bomb yeah. disposal were in. And, wow. Uh, so that was quite interesting okay and was this pre um you know fishing now so heavy regulated eu fisheries was this pre oh, it was that still was it very regulated different? Was it, it was still i mean yeah. we were we used to also do um, what we call pair trawling for herring so yeah. that's using two boats and you're using your fish finders to find the shoal and then you link the net from one boat to the other and you literally steam out swoop around this hall of herring and then you've it will take you probably three hours to get them all on board and you're normally straight to the kipper factory where we were in imath but doing that we often hit a salmon run as well because there was a lot of salmon running and um, so you could get 30 40 50 salmon which technically you had to put back in and mm. um, but the salmon caught at sea you could almost play cricket they were like bars of silver and then what happened and we weren't part of this in any way but there were boats putting out great big drift nets literally catching the salmon at sea and yeah no, no matter how much catch and release we do in our waters because here the avon the stour the test the itch and it's all catch and release you can't keep a salmon you catch mm. but yeah if the guys are out catching them at sea before they come to the rivers no amount of catch and relief will make mm. that better okay it just always seems such a uh, complicated issue as a, what you can and what you can't catch, the complexity of bycatch, what you've got to throw back in the ocean, even if it's dead. It seems like yeah. a, a we really were still, messy we, process. We were, I mean, I wasn't, I was young. I wasn't that involved. That's the skipper's work. But we, there, there were times when we hit our quotas and we had to stop fishing mm. because we couldn't catch any more. But I also look back on how much fish we were catching. Um, I mean, boxes and boxes of it. And I just wonder how we can continue yeah, catching so much and eating so much. Hmm. And so a lot of people say, because we run a fish restaurant, well, do you use only native fish? Yeah. So, well, no, if it's, 
if it's correctly farmed, we'll use that as well because we have to, to protect you know, nature stock. Mm. So conservation yeah. has to come into our life. Yeah, very much. And then you've got to look into what are the fish that you're farming being fed because sometimes we're exactly. using another species of fish yeah. just to farm the species that we want to eat. So it's, it's complicated and we, we may well come back to it, but because I want to continue a slightly uh, chronological story, any interest in, in cooking the fish at this point? You're catching it. Where, I, catch the I love to preparing it. Um, well, we ate very basic food on board, very basic. It was stews and... So where does the where's simple. the first trigger then that actually gets you into the into the kitchen that comes well, later? Well, when when I left the trawler, um, came back down. Well, I did a little bit in the Craig and Gelt Hotel in in Dunbar in the off season because the boats couldn't go out to sea, so I had a, a job to keep me going, um, and that was more sort of a, a running the not running but waiting and working in their bar, and then I came back down south um, to Romsey, um, not far from here and uh, worked in Winchester. Uh, but that was in uh, Debenham's men's fashion for a little while, which sounds posh, but it wasn't men's fashion, it was selling shirts. <laughs> and um, then um, fine arts decorating service, which was just like B&Q, but smaller. Um, and I needed extra cash, so I got a job at a hotel as a waiter. Um, and then decided that, do you know what, I really love hospitality. So I gave up. My day job became a full-time waiter, and I would have been about seventeen by then. Okay, go on. You've yeah. done, done a lot. And what was it about hospitality that, that got under your skin so quickly? Uh, I just love people. Really love meeting people, talking to them. Uh, the whole, I, I, I suppose, the, the 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 regime of going in. You had your people working above you, and yeah, as you got further up, people working under you, and that whole. Do you know what? I nearly joined the Navy, but didn't. And I think, in actual fact, catering, especially old-fashioned catering, in the kitchen or in the restaurant, it's a regime. You know, you have your... In a, way, in a restaurant, it's your commie waiter, your waiter, your chef de rang, your senior chef de rang. Yeah, it just goes through, and it's this lovely regime with people employed to do a certain job to a certain standard. And in the kitchen, it's the same with your commie chef, your, your chef de... The party, uh, the section chef, and it's it's just that that regime. And I think maybe that goes back to the the time with Dad when he was in the Royal Air Force. I mean, it doesn't faze me to see a fully laid up table with lots of cutlery in that because yeah, we were invited to these dinners in the Air Force, and so I, we, I'd sat at them before even as a child. Hmm. So maybe that's subliminally where yeah, it came from. It's true, and I don't think people appreciate when you, you know, especially with uh, functions and big weddings, you know, a couple of hundred people in a, in a room, and uh, hospitality has a reputation of being sometimes a stopgap or a job you do in between jobs. But actually, that military precision, the timing precision, I think even more so in the kitchen, where you know all of that food's got to leave the kitchen in a really tight window. I've spoken to a lot of my head chefs, and, and there's often a, a, a different management style with the brigade, particularly in service, in the kitchen compared to front of house and, and military is what it always gets referred to basically because you can't really you know negotiate in service in service is short sharp time strict you know barking orders and then out of service it's a couple of beers and you relax so yeah i think there is a, a oh, synergy okay. Def there. definitely definitely yeah. and i think i mean if you haven't got perfect preparation you're you're, you're gonna yeah struggle. very true yeah, yeah it's too late once you're in the, and in, in, the, in the old days when i was not in the old days in the younger days yeah there was a lot of tension and do you know what? As you get older, you, that irons out because you you know how to prepare yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so your front of house, you're waiting. What what gets yeah. you into the kitchen? Where's the first point where you start? Well, to cook? I, I went from uh, sort of several jobs from the one that was in just outside Romsey, the Potter's Heron, and then I went to Limington. There was a little restaurant called the Slip where I worked there, and all still as a waiter. I then got a head waiter's job at New Park Manor. Yeah, in the New Forest, which is really interesting. Um, still going, isn't it? It's still going, different guises, but yeah. Um, yeah, it, it was interesting. I enjoyed the history of New Park Manor. Then I went out to Stockbridge to the Grosvenor Hotel, which had just been taken over by some some lovely people, so I think that will re, relight. But then I went to a restaurant owned by this Frenchman called Jean-Claude Denat, and this restaurant was on the edge of the New Forest, and... Uh, it was called Chanticleer. And I went there as an um, assistant head waiter and quite soon got the job as head waiter and in, in, in the end became the, the, the manager, um, working under Tessa, his wife. So Jean-Claude in the kitchen, 
test for myself out front. And um, that probably is where I polished my skills as a waiter, yeah, restaurateur even, because they were very good restaurateurs. It wasn't, wasn't what I do today. It was in the Michelin Guide. It was in the Good Food Guide. It was in the Eagle Rone. It was sort of, yeah, for my birthday, they, as a present, they sent me to Tudon, which then was the only one-star Michelin in the area. And so that's where my sort of culinary career, let's call it culinary, and that's in both front of house and I suppose the beginning of of wanting to do a bit of the other side. Yeah. And Jean-Claude and Tessa sold Chanticleer, sort of 82, 83. And I'd always tease that one day I'd open my own restaurant. Uh, Chanticleer is a nickname of a cockerel. And um, I teased that I'd call it Le Poussin. And we'd just been made redundant because I wouldn't stay for the new owners because I wanted to run my own restaurant. So why would I stay and teach him how to run Chanticleer when I'm going to open up in the area? Um, we went to London and at the time we were passing Upper Brook Street, Gavroche, Friday night it was. I said, let's go and eat there. Very naive. And um, so I walked in, could we get a table? And they said, yes, but you must be a tie and you must be out by half past eight because it's quite early I said yes no problem and we had the most memorable meal and my wife said if you can cook like that I'll back you as a chef and um, I said well you'll be doing the front of house then and then in um, 1983 we were both around 25 um, we bought this little cafe restaurant in Brockenhurst called it Le Poussin Caroline was eight and a half months pregnant I bought two sets of chef's whites and a couple of cookery books and went in the kitchen and we opened yeah well done you were brave I was <laughs> mad. you were mad yeah. yeah let alone with a with a with a brand new baby so you you'd done a bit of cooking by this point presumably no, no? no literally no, no, just no, said i'm no, going to no, i'm going to run a restaurant yeah. wow yeah, because with your you know we'll, we'll come into what you then achieve but self taught then fundamentally Com- completely self taught i've yeah. never worked in another chef's kitchen wow that's um, incredible and the I suppose what I did though, because I knew all my what my customers would want, I wrote my menu around what I thought the customers would want and, and learned how to cook okay. it. And you knew that from your front of house I experience. I knew that from my front of house nearby. experience. And actually, so many chefs don't have that front of house experience. Having both is fundamental, particularly like you say, the difference between being a restaurateur and being, you know, in employed service is yeah. a very different skill, I think, isn't it? Yeah. And it's it's I think you have to chefs, we all write menus that we want to eat, but you also have to write menus that the customers want to eat. That's exactly the words I've I'm laughing because I've had that conversation so many times with chefs where yeah. I go, the special sport, that's where you yeah. can do, you know, really show off your flair and get excited and be interested, no problem at all. But we, we do also have to sell what people want to buy. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's, a common, it's a common part of it. Um, so how quickly did that take off then? You bought this business, you had a brand new child. How were those first couple of uh, well, years? That's I when mean, most the, restaurants fail in the first the, 24 the, the, months. The first, first week was, was good. Caroline was bossing everyone out front with a big, big um, bump. inflated bump. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I just remember distinctly that I think it was the Monday or the Tuesday night. We only had a couple of bookings in. Caroline had gone into labour, and I wanted to serve these people. And um, I got managed to get them to have three courses. <laughs> and then said, "You aren't having coffee because I have got to take my wife to Southampton Hospital." Wow. And um, so as soon as it went closed, popped her in the little mini clubman estate we had, and um, bumped away into Southampton Hospital. And she gave birth to uh, Alex, um, AJ, uh, Alexander Joseph, as he's called, and uh, following my family tradition of naming one of the boys Alex. And um, I arranged for a Rolls Royce to bring her home. And whereas a week earlier for, for I was... Asking for forgiveness, were you? <laughs> yeah, part <laughs> forgiveness. And just let's start the way life okay. should do. And, and I just felt... The week before I'd been physically ill on the forest with anxiety of what have I done to my family... And then the business wasn't bad, but the new baby coming in, I mean, her doctor visited two days later. Caroline's in service back at work already. And, yeah, the doctor's holding the baby and I'm cooking him dinner. And we were lucky. We got in the good food guide very early. And then the Egon Roney Michelin followed. And the business was great right from right from day one really we were we were very fortunate but we worked hard to make ourselves fortunate but we were very fortunate and then with having got into a good food guide and got into a michelin guide it was like oh what's this michelin star business 
And I became besotted with wanting a Michelin star and to become a really, really good chef. I wasn't, I wasn't happy for just being. Do you think that was just business. inbuilt into your your DNA that drive? Because presumably not not at school. So wh- where did that yeah, I think obsession so. come from? I, I mean, it just just became an obsession. It was it was a gr- it was great to have a really amazing goal which I was completely in control of. Um, though you're subject to being appraised by food writers and food critics, but it was something I felt I could do, and I threw myself into it completely. And yeah, I'd be up. All night. And Caroline would come down for breakfast in the morning and there'd be a ballotine of rabbit to try. There'd be a poussin stuff with prawns. There'd be all sorts. And I, I just worked night and day, completely loved every minute of it. Wow. So it was 12 years after you'd bought the place, I think, that you got your first Michelin star. How long had you actually been consciously trying for? Well, I'd been consciously trying probably for six years. Wow. But what was really interesting was um, during that period, I'd brought in some... Um, chefs to work alongside me which had some more experience than me because I was <laughs> self-taught and I brought a waiter Patrick Flory Miguel lovely man who was um, ex um, restaurant manager at um, the Waterside Inn um, there was a great uh, French stroke Argentinian Sergi Caldron um, who came to work for me I, brought, I imported French front of house staff as well and we had a great 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 time um, but never got it. And um, not many people nowadays remember this, but the late 80s, there was a massive um, recession looming, really massive, and nothing, nothing like the ones we've been through recently. And there was an Indian restaurateur looking to get into Brockenhurst to open an Indian restaurant. And I'd expanded Pusan sideways and backwards. And so I sold him the front, uh, leaving me with just the bit at the back. And um, it was really quite quite risky because he didn't quite have enough to pay all of it, but I took the risk and left 20000 on a deferred payment. But what it did do, and this is late, I say late 80s, early 90, was it allowed me to pay off all my debt. And I opened a Poussin, ran the back in a little 24-cover restaurant, with myself and my sous chef in the kitchen, my wife and our eldest son, Justin, in the restaurant. The bank manager came round and said, he was Scottish, so excuse the accent, um, Derek, if you hear this, but he said, oh, Alex, I don't know if the bank will continue to support you. And I said, well, actually, fact, I've paid off my debt, so I don't need your support. And Derek was brilliant to me. He was a, such a mentor, helped me through a lot of financials. Um, and so I literally, I turned into this 24 cover restaurant. I cooked my food, my way. If you enjoyed it, eat it. If you don't, go and choose somewhere else. But it was only 24 covers, so I could do that. And before I did that move, I phoned Michelin and said what I was thinking of doing. Because they, they tease you. They give you this letter every now and again saying, we may be able to include your culinary specialities. And they only do that if you're getting a star. Okay. So I'd had that for two years. And I thought, wow. is it now? And they said, look, I can't tell you how to run your business, but, but, and I think, I'm going to do it anyway. And so I, I literally, all the French staff went home. Um, we turned to this little restaurant. A year later, I get a phone call from, of all people, Jean-Christophe Novelli, um, quite a well-known celebrity French chef who'd worked the area a lot. And Jean-Christophe phoned me up and said, I'm at the launch of Michelin. Congratulations, Alex, you've got a star. Wow. Um, Wow. Yeah. How yeah did you celebrations. Oh, yeah. Top of the moon. Did you say, so do you, you don't know when they're coming in? Did you know the person who'd been you into d- it? Or? Looking back, um, you don't know because they, they will visit you more than once when they're doing that. But one meal in particular, um, Rebecca, who was the, the then one of the inspectors, she's now the editor, um, asked to see me after the, the lunch she had. And I was too busy and I didn't have anyone to take over what I'm doing. So I said, you'd love to come back and see me later. Which is being a bit brash. Most people, if Michelin say, can I see you, just drop everything and say, yes, of course. Yeah. But um, they, so. they, 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 they probably respected that. And you then uh, sustained it for how many? Was it 15 well, years? I st- sustained it for five years at the Little Poussin in Brockenhurst. Yeah. Um, then we bought Park Hill, um, linking in with um, Jim Ratcliffe, now Sir Jim Ratcliffe. And um, when we bought Park Hill and moved Poussin into it, 
and we regained the Michelin star there. But that was quite a development because we'd gone from 24 covers to now having you know, weddings for 80 and doing 60 to 80 covers. So a big transformation. So, yeah, it went from small to big. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's Mich- a huge change. Yeah, and Michelin were really worried, would I, would I be able to do it? Were you? I did. I got the Michelin star. No, but were you I, worried? I was worried, yeah. Oh, yeah. I the, anxi- the anxiety I had opening Poussin came back again, moving Poussin to Park Hill. And um, I remember pacing up and down inside the office, drinking lots of mineral water to try and calm the anxiety. And I was very good, actually. My wife was always fantastic the way she looked after me because I didn't drink. Really? I just drank lots of water. I mean, I'd still, I still love a glass of wine, but I never drink on duty. That's good. Only ever afterwards, and preferably not too much, so you are good enough to work the next day. Yeah, that's day. good, because that's unusual in hospitality. So I think the, the, uh, the problem with a lot of people in the industry is you're permanently surrounded by booze, and quite yeah. often in your own place you don't need to pay for it, and it becomes a problem for people, isn't it? So it, it's good, it, good to sustain it that profession. 100% does, but I have this real rule, and I still, to a certain extent, stick by it today. Yeah, I'll be doing an event this Thursday, and it's a, a food and wine evening. I actually won't drink till I finished. Yeah, um, it's it's my sort of clutch of being yeah. staying sober and being sensible and long life. Yeah, well done. And you you mentioned that feeling of uh, literal of nausea. I mean, I've had it myself when when you open businesses and that 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 genuine fear where you, where you feel like you you could actually vomit on the spot. Yeah. And, and I think that can either be you know a bit of a buzz and a great motivator and you're like wow you know you you really wake up or it can terrify you to the point where you realize you're not destined to be entrepreneurial but you you thrived on that presumably i thrived on the adrenaline i think yeah that yeah. comes with it and um the uh, the anxiety i don't like i wish i could stop the anxiety i still have days when it's there is anxiety linked to it and um, yeah whenever i'm doing a a podcast, <laughs> uh, but if it's if it's something on TV, I mean, I did yeah about twenty TV shows over my career, and those were always anxious to make sure you're going to get it right. But in actual fact, there's people controlling it; they're going to help you get it right. So, yeah. who was that with the TV shows? Um, it was I did a couple with the BBC, but mainly they were with the local Meridian. Right. Uh, and did did a great one which I loved, and there was when there was more money around, and it was called At Home with Maggie. And that was Maggie Philbin that did Blue Peter and Tomorrow's World and things. And I went to her house and um, I was the chef. There'd be, it was um, uh, Prochaski, the gardener was in there. And she'd invite guests off the moment in and it would be different people that were in the news. And so it's what they call a magazine programme. But I always remember one of the people that turned me on to food in my early days was Robert Carrier. And he used to do this thing with wine, food and friends. And it was almost a a simpler version of that. So I really loved it. And we used to shoot two shows in a day and at a house just in Berkshire was at the time. And it was a great buzz. And I got paid well for that in those really? days, yeah. yeah. Nowadays, you just do it for free to get publicity. Yeah, yeah. Fill, fill, fill your restaurant. Um, clearly in that journey, I mean, you, you, you were... To, to cut down to 24 covers and go for Michelin star, from a financial perspective, was that a difficult decision? Because were you taking less money by reducing the covers and having that obsession, or was that actually a business acumen decision the, as well? It was a pure business decision because with the bank rates the way they were, the wages we were paying to the number of staff to run a bigger restaurant, it equated to I paid more to the bank and I paid more to the staff than I paid to myself. And that's not adding them all up together, that's individually. And um, interest rates went from 8% to 16%. I mean, look back now, imagine if, imagine if you were paying 16%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's don't, don't, don't make me actually be sick, Alex. Yeah. Be, I, do, be I do have anxious. a lot of debt. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that is, that's, that was scary. And mm. the, the great thing, the, the bit that I left with the, Indian because he couldn't afford to buy it or um, Mr. Mir, mustn't call him just an Indian. He was a, it, we got on great. Yeah. It was a very smooth transaction. And um, the bit I left it with him was at um, 2% over base rate for six months to help, help him pay it off. Right. No, it was interest free for six months. Then it went up to 5% over base. So I was earning 21% interest on the money I'd left with him. Right. And I had a charge on the building. So I was... Yeah, okay, yeah. so it worked. Because it worked. It's, quite, it's quite a small restaurant to try and make viable yeah. now, I imagine, if you were trying to open a 24. You'd have to be in there doing it yourself. Well, that's that why, level, basically, that's why Park Hill came along. Yeah. Because I was 38, 39, and I could have carried on with Caroline doing what we were doing, but we were never going to make any 
yeah, real life would just about fund the pension and that would be it. And someone approached me to go into partnership at Park Hill and I didn't like that someone. So the estate agent said, well, find a backer. No, why didn't you buy it? And so I spoke to Derek Allen, my bank manager, and he said, well, find a backer. And I approached three, all of which were interested. But um, Jim Ratcliffe used to stay there when he set up his first petrochemical company. So he had a soft spot for Park Hill. He ate with me for celebrating his um, flotation of that company when he became uh, a multimillionaire. So it was a soft spot for me. And so I put in, or I, Caroline and I put our business in and he put in a chunk of money and we bought Park Hill. And that's when we went to the bigger hotel. I was then 40 and felt that I was now on another journey where I now can start saving for something else, something bigger. Right, okay. And what was that something bigger? You started doing some work in France around that time. Well, well it yeah. sort of grew with, with Jim. Because um, we, we took Park Hill from 1999 to 2004. And in that time, I negotiated with New Forest Parks, New Forest Planning, and then it became a national park. And I negotiated a massive refurbishment of Park Hill and a lot of new buildings as well. I, I was backed by um, Tony Clemson from the Tourist Board and things to, to, to achieve this. Um, it was, it, was, it was monumental to get that much planning permission in the new was forest. Was this when it changed to the, the Limewood? Or was this and this, pre- is, this was the start of Limewood. Right, okay. And yeah. um, so I worked with the planners and then with the architects, along with Jim. Jim had a big say in it because it's his cash. Yeah. And, and it was a um, phenomenal level of investment from him, wasn't uh, it? It was 60 million. Yeah. yeah. It's just, Let's just it's say 60. Mind, it could be 50. Me. It could be 70. Yeah. Um, but it was, and it wasn't planned to be that. The, the, the original estimate was 16 million. Wow. But... It snowballed. And then, because in 2004, we were going to have to close that business in order to do all these alterations, um, I said to Jim, well, look, I can't just be on a payroll and not do anything. Plus, I've got some really good people um, I want to keep. Plus, over the five years we'd ran Park Hill, we'd refurbished, bought new beds and things like that. We just kept it going. Mm. And I said, we could do with finding a simpler hotel or a rundown hotel. So we looked at a rundown hotel, which was near, was Bramshaw area, and um, we didn't buy that. So we went for a slightly simpler hotel run by a husband and wife team in Brockenhurst. And um, we bought that off them. It's such a lovely transaction. Yeah. Yeah, Jim went and spoke to them because he had a friend who played golf with them. And um, they were looking to retire but needed two more years of revenue to get the retirement. And Jim just said, well, yeah, what are you earning? And they said, a figure, I don't think I'm saying anything out of order if I say it, um, of, uh, they had it valued at 1.6 million. They hoped to earn another 100,000 for the next two years to make it 1.8. And Jim said, well, there's 1.8 and you go at the end of the summer. Wow. And they dream, did. Dream scenario. And it was just, it was so nice. And I mean, they still come and see me. Really? Yeah, regularly. Nice. And um, eat my restaurant. And yeah. we're great friends. And so we moved. It was, that was an amazing day. So on the takeover, we agreed stock at valuation and, and their customers went out for the day. And bear in mind, some of them were coming back that evening. Right. And by the time they came back that evening, everything that I wanted from Park Hill and the Le Poussin plates and crockery and cutlery, we shipped in and the menu came in, all ready designed. Amazing. So people came back to a completely different wow. restaurant, which was, that's, which that's was fun. Good. And they enjoyed it, which was good. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it was a different style. Because normally there'd be some sort of closure, I guess, wouldn't there, yeah. between, between the With two. So absolutely that was... no closure. Okay. Yeah, carried on. And, and that was, yeah, the next five years of Michelin star at Whitley Ridge. Wow. Whitley Ridge, whilst, okay. So how many years was it in total then? In total it was 15, 15 years. years. So five oh. in the original Poussin, right. okay. five at Park Hill, and then five at Whitley Ridge. It's a nice and number. Whilst doing Whitley Ridge is what's running Whitley Ridge and the star, we were doing all the the building off what is now Limewood. And then there was a side ball that um, our partner Jim had bought some chalets in Courchevel and was um, struggling with the administration of them in Courchevel. And I jokingly said, well, we should have a hotel and the hotel can look after the chalets. 
And he came back with a hotel. Oh, really? So that's how I got involved in a hotel in, and chalets in Courchevel. Right. And what was your involvement there? Were you helping run them or <coughs> this we, were, we, we, we took them on and run them. We did. Right. Um, and um, they, they were sort of the, the French arm of our business. And we got planning permission there. I did some, lots of discussions there with the mayor and the architect. And we got permission to completely refurbish um, La Portetta. Um, put a spa and a car park two stories underground and build two new stories well one and a half stories on top and okay. convert it into what is it's the best hotel in 1650 Courchevel really? by a country mile and this was a restaurant as well restaurant as well yeah was it different because the French obviously have a much longer kind of um, history I suppose of, of, of proper restaurants and culinaire you were trailblazing hugely weren't you back in, in, in the 1980s there weren't many Michelin stars in this country was it very different going onto the onto the French turf yes and no because it was a ski resort and there was a lot of foreign people go to the ski resort it wasn't it wasn't um, true Les Bleus French yeah, it was it, it was ski resort food, um, and I have to say that since I've left, La Portetta has gone forward and forward and forward, and um, Angela Hartner, along with Robin Hudson, have, you know, have developed it even more. I mean, they've got this um, fire and ice outside barbecue buffet type thing goes on, and it's it's still it's brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have to go and check it out. So uh, what happens next? 2009, in essence, I think, is when you decide to make some big changes. Is that yeah, right? 2009, <laughs> um, we'd opened Limewood. And I'd interviewed chefs to set it up and get it going. Yeah, so I opened it. Um, the pig was starting to form. Um, and I suppose the life changed from all about Alex a bigger corporate situation. It couldn't be more diverse, could it? 24-cover yeah. Michelin restaurant yeah. too. I mean, you know, the, the line would... How many covers in, in, in the restaurant there? It's oh, the line when the scullery was 80, the restaurant was 80. And you were um, doing functions and weddings. And functions and, and huge weddings. numbers. And it was it's a huge, massive I mean, property. It, it, it worked fantastic and we all had a really good time and relationship. And I think I'd burnt out. Yeah, I'm I'd surprised. Done, <laughs> so yeah, big. I'd just done so many, so much operations when you think of project managing 50, 60 million at Park Hill, project managing La Portetta and chalets, including the, the personal chalets off the backer. But it was just, um, just done. Yeah, but and what then, a way to burn out to go through that, you know, that speed of, of transition from well, Poisson to, to yeah. 60 million quid in, in, yeah. in, in Limewood is... Yeah. Um, it, it, was, yeah. it was... That's a way to go, isn't it? Phenomenal, <laughs> and I wouldn't... <laughs> Wouldn't have, wouldn't change it yeah. um, at all, and so I decided to cash in my shares and um, with my wife Caroline, who's been there one hundred percent, and it's probably what has made me anywhere near the success I am. But um, so I um, decided to cash in my shares and resign my position, and um, look for something else. Did you have some time off? Or? Uh, yeah, I was on six months garden leave, so I sort of used that looking for somewhere. And the 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 choice of <coughs> where to go, what to do was, it was definitely going to be catering. So it wasn't going to be a, a nice little hotel. We looked at several hotels for sale. Um, that's why I was working through the the commercial sales and letting agents, yeah, Christie's and Savills. And uh, I think it was a guy from Christie's, um, Simon, that said, well, I know a place that's got a place they're looking for a, someone to take over, possibly on a leasehold. And he said, it's not far from you, it's in Dorset. And he said, it's highly confidential. I can talk about it now because it's happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. He <laughs> said, it's highly confidential. And it's um, Road South, which is currently run by... Gary Rhodes and the Harbour Group don't feel they're getting enough out of it, so they quite like to just earn a rent for the time being. And so I came and met here, I thought, wow, nice place. Then had some devious meetings, you know, which no one could be part of um, about what could we do, what couldn't we do, um, negotiating leases and things like that. And in the end, I suppose it was because of the position I was in and just come out of so much work and pressure. Uh, I said, do you know what? 
why don't we just try for three years and we can terminate with different clauses. I'll be cheaper as a consultant than Gary Rhodes, but I want more of the uh, a higher cut in the profits, but you're not making enough anyway. So without revealing figures, I put an offer on the table, they accepted. And we closed for a Monday and then reopened on a Tuesday after saying goodbye to Gary Rhodes. All done very, very amicably. And I didn't want my name on the restaurant. I, when I opened Limewood, it was the dining room by Alex Aiken, which I thought was pretentious. And I didn't want that. And I just wanted to open a lovely restaurant cooking food that people want to eat, not food pandering to a chef trying to earn a Michelin star. It's an expression that's been said to me. And I want to use all the local ingredients. I wanted to maintain as many staff as I could and be predominantly seafood because we were so close to the water's edge. So we call it the jetty because there's this jetty that sticks out. And there's, there's arguments over who came up with the name the jetty, but it's a brilliant restaurant name because you remember it. My first restaurant, Le Poussin. What a stupid name. <laughs> How do you spell it? How do you pronounce it? Yeah. yeah. What made you call it Le Poussin? Well, because it's Chanticleer was the cockerel. There's a spring okay. chicken. Right. Yeah. So Nice. And then instantaneous transformation. You, I mean, you know, Gary Rhodes was very well known at the time. I think it was considered to be quite unusual as to why on earth Gary Rhodes had rocked up and, and opened a restaurant in Christchurch because he was quite a well-known name. He um, was cheaper than James Martin. Is that what it was? <laughs> I did say that. <laughs> <laughs> One that I would have gone, but it was uh, it was strange because it had never really taken off. So here you are, you've you've now learned the art rather than the science of the restaurateur, I suppose. What did you do? How did you transform it so quickly? Well, one, I opened seven days a week because I wanted it to be a popular restaurant and I wanted it to be for the locals. They had a muscat, no a muscaday. They had muscaday on their wine list, and this is nine years ago, uh, thirty five, thirty seven pound fifty. People around here jump in their boat and go across to the channel and pick up the muscadet in the ports for, you know, a fiver, 750. So they won't pay 35 pounds. I mean, there are some amazing muscadets that are worth that and more. But it was like it was like a statement saying you have to be able to afford it to come in here. So I broke down the barriers, put out a set lunch menu, and, and I went to the, the key because I'd been a fisherman. So I went and spoke to the fisherman and said, what are you catching? I want to buy it. And I made sure they were paid, which is the one thing that every restaurateur should know. If you buy local, make sure you pay the people on time. But I just made it more local. And when Gary was here, yeah, there wasn't that use of local fish. It was Geiger Halibut, which is up you near know, the, the northwest of Scotland. Um, there was farm salmon. Yeah, it was just, yeah, whereas now we've got the local place, Brill, Dover Sole, the bass, the bream, yeah, the crab, the lobster. Yeah, there's no lemon sole caught local, but there is further west that we bring those up. So it's, 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 it's what I would call good British seafood, but it's what people want to eat, yeah. especially next to the sea. And how many years ago was that now? Nine years ago. Nine years? Well, it'll be, well. be nine years in August. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you, it, it clearly was successful and you've enjoyed it because your involvement with um, Harbour Hotel seems to have become more so over the years. Uh, it's, been, it's been a phenomenal time. I mean, the, that first year we broke even and we've made great money ever since. And yeah, the chairman and the, the directors of the Harbour Group asked me, could I do something at King's Arms, which was... King's Roads. So I was sort of following um, Gary's footsteps. And so we changed the King's Arms back to the King's Arms, not the King's Roads, and gave Christchurch its, its, its sort of nice inn back, um, developed a menu using all local products, um, got a Michelin Bib Gourmand, which was like, well, I don't want to go back down to Michelin, but <laughs> Bib Gourmand's nice. It's about great food at a reasonable price. It's not trying to reinvent wheels. Uh, and um, so we're very proud of that. Um, and then after the King's Arms, they said, would I have a look at what we could do at Christchurch Harbour Hotel? And that needed uh, quite a bit doing to it. Uh, and it sort of, it was, <clears throat> it was a sort of a, a light bulb moment for me. And, um, and I believe um, the group was, certainly hotels when you go to them, they don't have restaurants, they have dining rooms. 
Um, it's a bit different in London, but definitely when you go out to the provinces. And there's a certain manner to a hotel dining room. Um, probably all goes back to the old regimes I talked about being comfortable with in the beginning. But, yeah, the only people that went there that weren't residents were when they were going to a, a funeral, a christening, a wedding. You didn't go to hotel dining rooms to eat. And I, I spoke with the, the, yeah, the chairman and directors here and I said, look, can we change it into a destination bar and restaurant? We've got a beautiful terrace and the, the views, the location, it's as good as the jetty and let's do that. And we did. And um, since then, it's it's gone phenomenally well. And that that ethos has gone now throughout the Harbour Group, where we try to create standalone bar restaurants, yeah, with yeah, food for food and beverage within the hotel. They're trying to run them. I mean, it's not a restaurant with rooms because we've got sixty bedrooms. We're sat here near the Christchurch Harbour Hotel, but. It's that philosophy of, you know, even if you're in the, in the hotel, you have to book your restaurant time. You can't just rock up to a table d'hote meal that's pre-cooked and reheated. Everything's cooked fresh a la carte. And it's a bit, it's a bit more funky. It's a bit more music might be turned up a little bit louder than the old residential customers would have had. But it's, it's a transformation and it's the vibe now is very fresh, very bright um, and a great place to eat, relax, but, yeah, yeah, I, you're absolutely right, and uh, and I, I find it odd because it's still the case. We, you know, we're in a tourism town, aren't we? Bournemouth, Christchurch. There's still, I don't know, I'd guess over a hundred hotels that have dining rooms in them rather yeah. than restaurant. We were the same on a much smaller scale with Urban Beach that we managed to make it relevant as a bar and restaurant, maybe a little bit more uh, with rooms. But I suppose two questions. You know, why is it that that these hotels don't turn there? Um, spaces into dining room and probably more importantly what is it you need to change you you clearly have got that skill that you can walk into a space and work out how you turn it from a dining room into a restaurant and, and what is it that that makes a place feel like a restaurant and what is it that gives you a good night out because it's not just food is it oh, it's not just food um it is the personalities yeah if you employ the right people and 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 train them training is is correct as well and train them to be able to, when a customer walks into it, is to pick them up and make them feel good and look after them. And yeah, you can be a bit cheeky at times. You can be a bit avant-garde. And I'm probably too guilty of that, but I'm old enough to get away with it. But it, it is that changing the personality, the atmosphere, the decor is important. Um, I think the food on the plate is. Um, but if you've got a nice location, lovely staff, and you attract the right people because no matter how much you spend on decor, if you've got grumpy, horrible people coming in, it's not going to help at all. Mm. And it's interesting. I used to hate music in my restaurant. I was really anti. When, the, when I had a Michelin star, I'd bow to the food, bow to the chef. Um, but moving into creating the jetty and, you know, we turned the music up a bit. And when we turned Christchurch Harbour from the Christchurch Harbour restaurant to the upper deck restaurant because you've got the jetty on the front, the upper deck is slightly elevated. Um, yeah, we, we changed the, the, the soundtrack and turned the music up. Um, the waiters didn't wear ties and um, customers started. I remember one customer in particular, it was really funny. He'd been coming here for years and he was, oh, I'm not so sure. And, yeah. and the waiters haven't got ties on um, and... Uh, He's in a jacket. He's dressed like he's going to see his bank manager. He probably was a bank manager. And I actually said, cockingly, yeah, well, actually, you don't have to dress as a bank manager to come to dinner every night. Yeah, relax, yeah. Leave the jacket upstairs and take your tie off. And the next day he came down in a cardigan. Wow. And he said, you know what, you're right. Really? Um, and what is interesting on the music side of things, if you turn the music up a little bit, it's, it's really fun because you can turn up a little bit so people have to speak louder in order to be heard, which is really annoying at first, but it was quite fun. And I do it cheekily every now and again. So I turn the music up, everyone starts speaking a bit louder. I turn it off. And then you've got this, you haven't got music. Yeah, you've got true. that lovely, yeah, lovely, lovely yeah. buzz. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you, look when you walked into the jetty today for us to meet up. Instantaneous vibe. Yeah, you go yeah. in there and you think, yeah. Yeah, and, and there is, and that, you know, when you love hospitality, that's the thing you look for. It isn't the music, but it is so important to get it. And you're right. I'm, I always go in to my vins and it's normally music up, lights down, music yeah. up, lights down. I hate going in where 
you, like that pre bit where you yeah. haven't got the conversation and yeah. it happened and it still happens all the time it drives me bonkers i'm like why, why yeah. don't you notice that it's how a space feels and i can walk into a room in the same way that you can and you can feel yeah. when the energy's good and you can feel when it's not right and invariably it is yeah just turn the music up a little yeah. bit get that hum up but i don't think i often enough tell them to turn it down afterwards so i quite like that yeah once you it's just it's the catalyst because you're right it is, it is what you want to yeah. hear is that chatter and it, and it had an energy but i still find it amazing i was in the lake district last year in a in a hotel restaurant and and the chef was very chefy it was clearly his name all over the menu he'd gone you know trying to do really really decent food and i felt sorry for him actually because the food was 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 decent it was pretty good but it was exactly that it was a dining room in a hotel yeah. and it was a it was a beautiful spot it was by lake in coniston but you just it was so easy to fix you just thought light some candles put some music on uh yeah you know just turn the lights down a little yeah. bit in half an hour i could have changed the whole vibe of the place and it was the same in the bar just full bright lights and yeah you wonder why people don't do it and and that aspect it was the easy bit because then the challenge is how do you get your numbers to work and your team to work and your gp to work on all the rest of the business acumen but yeah it's it's, it's amazing how um, I guess that's why there's been such growth in the casual dining sector because that's the bit they're good at. Less so on the food, more so on the Yeah, it's interesting. Atmosphere. I have this philosophy on casual dining. And, yeah, because people always used to talk about McDonald's and Kentucky Fried, whatever, and the casual dining sector. And there's been your Jamie's Italians and some have been successful, some have not. But I always look at it as a, as a pyramid. And if that real basic casual... Dining is solid and a good foundation, and it is quite big. Then there's more to grow above it. And then at the very top, you'll have your Hestons and everything. And not everyone wants to aspire to be at the top of the pyramid, but it, it, it's sort of, I, I just feel that's how life is. Mm. And yeah, restaurant life, especially. Yeah, no, it's true. I've spoken to a few people, some uh, coffee roasters and even craft brewers. And, and I was surprised when I was chatting to craft brewers that their inspiration behind craft beer was actually drinking brew dog in Weatherspoons. And some of the, uh, the the conversation with the coffee roasters was actually the more people going into Starbucks, the more people then learn about exactly. what's on from there, what's the next premium yeah. range. Yeah. And although I my gut feel was stone. anti these big brands, actually you go, yeah, they are a stepping stone as long as we maintain that stepping yeah. stone and as long as people appreciate the uh, the value I suppose, of, of what comes next. So all the way through your career, and I, and I didn't know the history with the, with the trawlers, but that makes sense now, but you've always had a reputation for fish. As you said, you love the ocean. I guess yeah. a number of your restaurants have been by the sea, or if not the new forest. And, and even in the forest, you were about buying local. But specifically around fish, there's been a lot of um, publicity in the last six months specifically, I suppose, around looking after the oceans and plastic in the oceans and overfishing and all that kind of stuff. What's your experience from actually having been a fisherman and seeing the catches, knowing what comes in now? What can we do? either as the public or as restaurateurs to look after the ocean and are we doing it already what's your perspective on it i think there's a there's a lot being done but i think we also need to be a, a little bit more careful um the 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 plastics is 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 something which has come up and bitten us all on the bum and it's uh something which we are all addressing uh it's quite fun that go back to a life goes in circles you go back to Jim Ratcliffe and um, his company Ineos are probably the biggest plastic producer in the world or produce the, they, they probably don't produce it but they produce what's used to produce it if you like um, and his chef um, at uh, Limewood now um, did the Chefs Against Plastic it's really quite, wow. sort yeah, of okay. quite a, yeah. a funny point yeah. but um, I think fishing wise when I worked on the trawlers, it was dragging, dredging, trawling. And, and if we look at where we are here in Christchurch, there is no trawlers. It's static lines. It's um, long lining and static nets, which are monofilament, which is possibly not good, but they're more species specific. And the more species specific we can be and size specific. So the nets are bigger. So the small fish swim through and we only catch the, the adult species. Um, but there again, we can't catch all the adults, otherwise there will, will be no offspring. So I think it's, it's something we, we, we do have to make sure that we do keep sustainability. Um, other areas which I think they do well, and they've done it now on the Dorset coast, there's certain areas which are no-go, no fishing areas. They did that very well in Christchurch in New Zealand where certain areas were completely no-go and not allowed to fish. And the philosophy behind that is that in those areas, 
um, the fish are naturally prolific producing more fish. And of course, when that area gets saturated, they have to migrate to find new grounds for their own food and everything else. So it's when you're catching the migratory fish, not the mother stock. So I think it's a, a simple answer. Sounds, sounds logical. Is it happening? Do we know locally? Uh, it is happening. It's happening yeah. a little bit uh, along the Dorset coast. There is some sanctuaries. Right. And, and then again, there is the farm fishing. And if it's well-farmed fish, then there is nothing wrong with eating well-farmed fish. As long as it is well-farmed, then that can be dependent on what they're feeding the fish, dependent on how the fish are kept clean and what... That's, with some of the poorer fish farms when they were really salmon fish farming became such a massive business and they were everywhere and underneath the salmon fish farm you would have a desert because every all you, you put food in an animal it has to come out and what comes out is high in nightshades and everything else and destroys everything below i mean i've visited chalk stream um trout in romsey um, which is literally a stone's throw from a little bit of river and land I owned before I bought Pusa. And I know them quite well. And they, I thought they were they were good. I will use chalk stream trout. And there's the Scottish Salmon Company, which is in the Hebrides, and their salmon is amazing. Yeah, it's all organic. They've even started, instead of using, most farm salmon is using a, a Norwegian species, which grows quick and grows easy. But um, they're even using Hebridean salmon stock for their their their, their, their base fish, which is like nice. Like a rare breed. It's, kind like, of, a, it's uh, like a rare farming. breed. It is, okay. and they even they even they've got the rare breed the Hebridean, <laughs> and even their Norwegian. They've got their red label, and yeah, they're they're really trying to produce it amazing. But we have to pay more for it. Yeah, and most of our demand in our current life is to get things for less money. You know, the four letter word supermarkets are all about buying it and selling it cheaper. Uh, and I think that's then where you look at the biggest thing which we do is we buy too much, we don't eat it and we waste it. Mm. Yeah, it seems to be food waste is often more important than than, than the sourcing. Um, albeit with farming, do you ever use any of the overseas farms or only British? I know, for example, bass was coming in for Greece for quite some time, but it seemed to be that the you know, d- d- different standards, I suppose, of farming in different parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, I try very hard not to use bass unless I'm using the local bass. And so out of season, we try very hard not to have it on the menu um, for that very reason. And the same with bream in from Turkey. Yeah, it's not so good. I think there's, there's enough fish that we catch throughout the year that you can be as, as much as possible um, local. But if it's going to relieve the local stocks, then we then go through our fish suppliers to make sure they're accredited with the Sea Fish Society so that we are buying quality. Yeah, Marine Stewardship Council, I, I found fascinating a few years ago, and I don't know if this is still the case, so I might be a little bit out of date, but it was with uh, salmon. So the best, um, from a sustainability perspective from the Marine Stewardship Council, is uh, I think the salmon was caught off the Alaskan coast because there were plenty of reserves there. Yep. It was frozen at sea. It was sent to China for packaging, and then it was redistributed and posted around the world from China. And 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 it's that, that challenge of... I very much believe in buy local, follow the seasons. Uh, that's the kind of style of food we do. But it's clearly a complicated issue because not many people are going to go, the most sustainable fish you can get is frozen at sea, sent to China, and, no. then, uh, and then posted to yeah. be frozen, aren't they? Yeah, that, that was the accreditation given at the time. So, yeah, fishing, I think, is one of the most complicated, unlike animals, where at least they stay in the same place. Yeah, and the other thing is if you buy a piece of fish, it starts to deteriorate. You buy a piece of meat, it starts to improve, <laughs> or it can do if it's kept well. Yeah. Interesting point, fish, Dover sole. Do you know you shouldn't eat a fresh Dover sole? Really? Dover sole should have at least two days before yeah. you eat it. Okay. Otherwise, it is too tough. Really? Yeah. Only Dover sole? Or Only the Dover sole. Wow. I mean, some of the brill and turbot, turbot, if they're a bit big, they need a day. Really? But, but yeah, try, try, get a fresh Dover sole, skin it, if you can skin it and cook it fresh, but then do, have, it, have his sister or brother yeah. give it a day or 36 hours and try that one. Okay, there's a challenge for the, uh, for the listeners going off and buying their soul. What's your thoughts on the same in, uh, in meat then? So are you noticing a change in the last 18 months around uh, the kind of, you know, the plant-powered or the less meat-orientated and the impact of, of farming and restaurateurs? What's your thoughts on that? Because you've been doing this long enough to have seen uh, a number yeah. of I mean, changes. I'm, I suppose I, I was asked on doing a 
some work on the Christchurch Food Festival yesterday about food philosophy. And I suppose I'm a passionate for wild food. So the fish is wild. Yeah. Game is wild. Mushrooms, foraging, all the wild food. But I also understand you have to farm and I've, I've farmed my own food to a certain extent. Well, my wife does it and I dispatch it and use it. But we've done lambs with our own herd of um, Wiltshire horn sheep. We've done pigs, we've done large white, middle white, old spot, um, and a sort of a rough and tough breed out of the forest. Um, and we've had beef where we brought beef on our land. Uh, we brought them in at about a year and 18 months and we fattened them um, and it's interesting having had that insight into the whole you know, I've taken them to slaughter I've collected them I've butchered them and it was a struggle I would say five ten years ago because people were just eating fillet steak sirloin steak maybe a ribeye a rump if you couldn't afford the others um, but nowadays what is happening is we are using all parts of the animal and very much. And so I think the on the farming side, it's getting better, but the farmers are still struggling because we don't pay enough for our produce. Mm. Okay. Have you noticed uh, a change in what people are ordering on the menus in the last couple of years? So, you know, I, I've seemed to have, and it's again, it's whether that's urban myth or reality, I suppose, but just... Uh, yeah, changing food trends, I suppose, and, and much more veggies kicking around. I always found the vegetarians very angry and uh, would, would be the ones that were most likely to send me in complaint emails. And, and in my role to try and sort of stay ahead of a curve, started experimenting a little bit with, yeah. with, with more whole food. And it's, yeah, it's just I mean, been interesting watching that journey, I suppose. I, I, I decided you could either fight the vegetarian or embrace them. Yeah. And um, I was always told never to hit a woman and never to hit someone smaller than you. And most vegetarians are women or smaller than me. Um, so fighting's out of the uh, out of out of out of, uh, out, out of action, but so I embraced them, and so I tried to create for them something with as much creation as I did with um, my other dishes. Um, example: cannelloni of smoked salmon. This is fresh in my mind because I wrote the menu for a, a function recently. So that's a leaf of smoked salmon. It's filled with smoked salmon mousse, which is rolled to look like a cannelloni served on an avocado salsa with a light lemon dressing. I've made millions of them, and it's an easy, great function dish. And then you get the vegetarians. So I take some carrot, which I lightly smoke. I use a thin peeler and peel it, set it on a piece of cling film, fill it with a carrot mousse, roll it to look like a cannelloni, serve on the same avocado salsa with the dressing, and there you go. They've got identical dishes and and not using any um, funny product, if you like, because there's a lot of, I see there's a, for vegan, there's a vegan smoked salmon. I'm sorry, if you're a vegan, you just don't eat smoked salmon. You don't have to eat something that's imitating smoked salmon. You smoke carrot. Mm -hmm. No, perfect. I think yeah. that for me is key. There's a lot of work going on at the moment around artificially recreating meat, yeah. and uh, you know, stuff created in labs with chemicals and stuff, which it just seems odd. I, I agree 100. percent Is that, and we were guilty of it a little bit in the early days with vegan, in, in not really understanding it and being a little bit lazy. But yeah, just get back to the whole food and, and and the right ingredients. Would you have been needing to make that veggie dish 10, 20 years ago, or is that is that a relative? Ten years thing? ago, I was doing it. Yeah, yeah. twenty years ago. No, it wasn't so. Not so quite so needy. Yeah, seems to have changed. Um, your kids were brought up. So how many children have you got? Uh, two. Two, okay. Yeah. And they were brought up in that environment. I'm fascinated because I've got a 10 and 11-year-old and I'm seeing them sort of surrounded by that entrepreneurial uh, environment in the first instance and then food and drink. Certainly my son at the moment is saying that he doesn't want to uh, run the restaurant, although his reason for not wanting to the restaurant is the fact that I get too many emails, which always makes me laugh as to when, <laughs> when did a restaurant become a technology yeah. company, but it feels that way sometimes. Um, but your kids, yeah, so surrounded by hospitality, they ended up in, in the industry as well. And, and what was your thoughts as they were growing up? Did they end up, you know, washing up at nine years old? Were they very much uh, yeah, in the thick yeah, of this? They, they want pocket money. Dad runs a business, you can earn it. Um, yeah. And... Um, yeah, they, they both worked within the business. They didn't have to. Um, Justin, the eldest boy, um, did work with us. Um, he went off and tried work elsewhere, um, tried some other um, occupations as well, but came back to catering, and he was very good at it. He loved his food and wine. Loved food and wine. It's a great business to be in. AJ, the youngest son, 
Um, he had an um, education to degree level, which Justin didn't want to. He went travelling instead and never went back to university. And um, AJ went for a business uh, management degree and a marketing degree, uh, which he succeeded, got um, twos in both, I think. Um, but in, whilst doing it, um, he worked in the industry, catering, because it's a very easy one to work in while you're studying. And um, he said, Dad, I want to come and join you, uh, which was great. Yeah. But, I mean, he grew up totally engrossed in the business. He, yeah. had, a, he had a little um, camp bed with a portable TV under my prep um, table in my kitchen. Wow. So he could be with Dad. Really? Um, when he was a youngster. Yeah. So from the okay. age of probably six onwards and then he had when he it, it, for him it was cool i mean he would go to his football matches with his school and that and i always managed to get time between lunch and dinner this is when people say it's catering's horrible it's it's not and i always made time i went to every football cricket rugby match of both boys and um because they're never at lunchtime and they're never in the evening <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. just make the time but They'd all come back. Yeah, they'd all say, oh, can we go back with, with um, AJ's dad or Justin's dad? And we'd do a bypass around the restaurant. They'd get a big steak sandwich or something before dropping them off home. Yeah. And yeah, later in life, it was always, we were great because if you want to bring friends around, the, the fridge was always full. Um, yeah, there was something cooking or something could be cooked quite quickly. Yeah. So they've, I think they've, they've really enjoyed it and they're both still in the industry. That's good. So you wouldn't have had any desire to talk them out of it then? You love you love the industry enough all the way through to be happy with that decision? I completely love the industry. And the industry is changing. And I think people are working less hours, finally. Though, so, yeah, I still probably do seven days a week, minimum eight hours a day. So it's relative day. less, I think, isn't it? We're um, a- but, yeah, you... you it's, it's just, I was told when I worked, going way back to the beginning of this podcast, I was told by the, the Isaac Levine, the Jewish man that owned the restaurant uh, Greenways in Romsey when I was 13. He said, you should come into this trade, Alex, because remember, to live, you need food, you need drink, and you need shelter. And we offer all three. There will, you will never be out of work. Yeah, no, it's very true. And, I, and I, I get excited by the fact that even though, you know, we, could, we become dominated more and more by uh, social media and by tech businesses and web businesses, you're absolutely right. Still, the fundamental point of being on planet Earth surely has to be the time that you spend with your friends, and with your family, and your kids and all that kind of stuff. And what a privilege it is that we work in an environment where we create that and still keep it interesting. Yeah. And yeah, food shouldn't just be about fuel sometimes yeah. it is sometimes we need it but as much as possible it should be taking some time oh, out to yeah, sit and spend is. time and, that, and, and that's, it's, it's like it's, it's like if you want to buy a new jacket you can order it online as such and you don't miss out on an experience but yeah eating out in a great restaurant in a great location with you know, great service great friends everything else you put that whole package together and yeah, people will pick up their mobile phone nowadays and as soon as you put the food in front of them it's Take a picture, hashtag food porn, and off it goes. But you can look at the picture, but it still won't satisfy you as much as actually eating and having... I mean, in the senses, it's your eyes, it's your nose, the smell, it's the taste, it's texture, it's... Yeah. yeah, that's what creates memories, I think, isn't it? You have that 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 smell or that noise or something that brings back a memory, and uh, and being in restaurants is where those where those memories are created. Um, so you've worked with some incredible people. You've achieved so much in in so many different areas of the business. Looking back, are there any really good nuggets of advice that you've received that were were you know really good for you, or have you administered any? Or, or the flip side is, is there any really crap advice where you've gone, man, I wish I'd not followed that? Uh, well, one. I do write menus that people want to eat, but don't write a menu to try and please everybody. Because that just can't happen. Yeah, and you know what? The busier you get, the less chance you have of pleasing everyone. If you're cooking for 24 people, there's a pretty high chance you're going to please everyone because you've got complete control. When you're cooking for 124, there's more chance you're not going to please everybody. 
don't get too upset with TripAdvisor. I was going to say, this is exactly my next question, is <laughs> yeah, recognising that. What but, do you do about Because that feedback now is no longer always polite, is it? I think the um, anonymity of social media, and particularly yeah. places like TripAdvisor, means people are pretty bloody rude, isn't it? Aren't they? Yeah, but I think the, the, the ones which are really rude, you can work hard to get taken down. Um, and the if you've let it get that bad, you've done something wrong in your business anyway. And the other thing is, if you look at it, don't look at individual pokes, but look if there's a trend. If people are saying your, your staff are, are unwelcoming, then pretty much you need to have a little chat with your staff. If someone's telling you that um, the, uh, the beef isn't good and lots of people are telling you that, it's like, look at your beef. So don't, don't take one personal onslaught because I'm, I'm not sure if everyone does but I take every single criticism right in the heart I just I still do it for the love of what I do I get paid well I've earned money in my life in this business but it's still more about the person that sat there and how happy they are Unless it's someone that's written a bad trip advisor, then it's how much money can I get off them? No, it's not. That's not. But it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's that. I do. Yeah. It's still that. Oh, it's phenomenally personal. And I don't think you get it in any other industry. I speak to my accountant and I'm like, how often does somebody go on and publicly slate you and say, oh my God, you know, you ran out of paper clips on Monday morning. And that means you're a, you know, you're a, you're an embarrassment to the accountancy yeah. kind of industry, but you run out of fresh fish on a Monday and you're like, look, yeah. it's been rough at sea and the fishermen yeah. haven't been out for three days. And there's a reason why there's no fish on the specials board. Yes, we are a restaurant that overlooks the ocean, but we, we buy local fish, but people have got no idea. It was one of the motivations yeah. for launching this podcast. I thought rather than just kind of going out and kind of trying to explain to people one at a time, let's actually have a conversation around where our food and drink comes from and the complexities and yeah, the graph that people put in. And we were chatting earlier about, you know, sometimes if you, if you get last year was a great example, you know, it was nine, almost 90 days of unbroken sunshine. And I look at my team and we're right on the seafront and you think, my God, those guys are working hard. That management team are so committed. They haven't had a day off. You know, they're all putting in the extra hours because they love hospitality. They love making you happy. They love looking after people. And when somebody comes along, I've become more thick-skinned, but when somebody comes along and, and has a pop at you about, you know, your lack of, uh, or it's a license to print money, and you, yeah. know, you just think, my God, you know, have some respect for, the, for how hard those guys work. I don't mind, but I know that that manager hasn't seen his kid for four days because he's been doing back-to-backs because he just wants to look after you. So, yeah, yeah it can be heartbreaking uh, for your team. But the flip side is, like I said, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to work in an environment where people are fundamentally enjoying themselves and coming for a good time uh, a, a little bit. Um, you've also got a really good reputation for retaining your team, uh, particularly with chefs. So it's a challenging uh, job, vocation. You're in a hot box, often a windowless box. It's high pressure. What do you say to young people who are looking at coming into the chefing world? Do you talk them out of it? Or if you don't? No, How no, I try to talk them into it. And I think it's, yeah, if, if I do anything over the next 20 years, um, it would be great to get a little bit better work-life balance with the chefs. And I think there's there's lots of people trying to do that. And um, I think, yeah, I look back to when I started, it was a five and a half, six-day week. And it was split shifts. And the the wages were poor. I look at today's world, and not just because of the living wage, but um, I think there is a there, there, there are good earnings to be had in this industry, and I also think that yeah we try we would love to get to a four day week, um, because I think the hours we do, uh, even in a four day week, you could easily be doing sixty hours, um, you know four fifteen hour days, um, and straight shifts. But even that, I've been quite nice if it was, you know, you started on a late shift, so you had that day in bed in the morning if you're a youngster. And, um, you know, you, you work late on your last shift because, you know, you can never lay in afterwards. So I think we have to, we have to try to, to, to make sure that the, the hours aren't crucified. Um, I always always demand of, and I don't write the rotors anymore, but with my staff writing rotors, I don't want to hear of anyone not getting two days off together unless it's by their choice. I don't want to hear that someone's done a 10 day straight because they had two days, then a five day shift, then a five day shift, then two days off. I just think it's unhealthy. Uh, it might be on times they've done that because they're creating a, a, 
the, a, a, a bigger group of data off, which is, if it's all agreed, it's fine. But I just, I, I just think that we have to, uh, even if people say they don't mind, we have to make sure that we don't abuse them and that we help them have a great life. I think one other thing as well, chefs need to eat out more. All these young chefs, yeah, we're, we're doing it now where we're, we're sending them to go and eat at different restaurants because no matter how good it looks in the kitchen, it looks different when you go out to eat it. And I think, I, I mean, I'm self-taught. I never went to work in anybody else's kitchen, but I ate in everybody else's restaurant. And I was robbing ideas left, right and centre. I was deciphering, working out how they got to those tastes, reading books, everything else. I mean, yeah, I just didn't have a teacher, Hmm. but I just read the same books that they were reading at schools and colleges to a certain extent. Yeah. And if you're a young chef uh, listening to this, the one is definitely, I think the industry is getting better. I think the the angry chef reputation of certainly five, definitely 10 years ago, of that, of that very kind of a, a macho, masculine, aggressive environment, I do think has changed. I think the pay is improving. I think the hours are improving. But the actual job itself, the buzz, you know, can you just describe what's it like in the kitchen on a Saturday night, eight o'clock, 8.30, when you're in service? What, what, what do you love about that feeling of being in the kitchen at that time? Uh, I think my love is probably half past five, just before it starts. And I bounce. I literally bounce up and down like a boxer going to go into a ring. Though it's not a fight. Or like, look at the Premier League footballers when they're stood in the tunnel. Their adrenaline, their feeling, they're jumping up and down, they're, you know, they're, they're going through their routines. Um, with me, I'll be making sure that everything's lined up in a, in a straight line, ready for service. And then the excitement, that buzz, the adrenaline is amazing. And then when you get through and when you get to that, yeah, you've got the first table through and then the second, because you're doing a second sitting, starts to come in. And it's how you've managed that and how the front of house team have managed it. And, and there will be at some point in every Saturday night that squeaky bum moment. But you just, yeah, shouting won't fix it. It'll make it worse. If a waiter comes in and asks for another portion of French fries, just do it. And you can have a shout afterwards if you want. But just concentrate one tick at a time, one check at a time. If you just do it and you, you you get it done and then at the end of it that cold beer the end of service when you've cleaned down don't have the beer before you've cleaned down you've cleaned down done your orders cold beer go home but that the satisfaction and then that's really important that's where I that's where I'm that's the granddad now that's where I am important because I'm going in making sure the teams feel that good before service during service and I try to pick them up on something there. They're never in the middle of a busy service, but if I have to, I'll pick them up on things they're doing wrong. But I'll also give them something of joy as well. Yeah. And in my old days, I used to say, if you shout at one of your young chefs, you make sure before he goes home, you've told them something he's done good. But I like to think that I'm, I'm uplifting people, keeping that, because it's, I feel happy. I want everyone to feel happy. Uh, I don't physically work as hard as I did 20 years ago, but I still want to be the presence and want to be nurturing these young people coming in and always have time for them all. Good. Thanks. That's a great sales pitch because I think it is such a, you know, I love the kitchen. I, I, I'm the same. I can't do it, you know, every day now, but I was in the kitchen enough that it's such a lovely energy. I do love the vibe, the uh, sometimes the banter or sometimes just the very straight talking. But yeah, the energy in peak service uh, in a restaurant is uh, is a really exciting place to be. And it's disappointing. I think, you know, I, I was chatting to the uh, the college and there are less people going through the traditional uh, classic training of, of, of chef school at the moment. So I think we've got some work to do. And we've obviously got less of the uh, European, Eastern European market coming through and, and taking on the apprenticeships. So uh, yeah, I really hope we get a resurgence of people people getting getting back into it because it is a phenomenally exciting it's you know so much more exciting than working in a bank and I've done that and it was boring yeah oh it was 100% and it's, it's interesting because they also talk about I'm go, not going to go into catering because of the working hours but shelf sackers that's yeah. what I'm trying to get to whether it's little oldie Tesco Waitrose Safeway Sainsbury's all of them where you could probably get now with a, a living wage you get the same money working as a chef 
in your training or going shelf sacking. And you don't want to become a chef because of the hours. Do you know what? Tesco's open 24 hours a day. We're only open lunch and dinner. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it is. That, yeah. yeah. Whereas the chef, I think the chef's working hours have got better. I think everybody else's working hours, unless they're in white collar work, um, has got more because it's, everything's open longer. True. Yeah. And yeah. everyone's open seven days a week. Hmm. The other thing with us, I think, is there is a real opportunity to progress fast, isn't it? It's not an industry where you need classic qualifications or training. Uh, you can move quickly. If you've got the right attitude and you learn fast and you're willing to graft yep. and work, your your uh, salary progression and your status progression is fast in this industry. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. All my chefs that have reached a certain level are earning at least £25,000 a year. And on top of that, with bonuses and the gratuity shares that they get, because they, all the gratuities in this group go straight to the staff, they'll be earning another £5,000. Yeah. So it's not, yeah, it's the same as what teacher starts on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the trajectory from there continues to be positive. So uh, what's next? You seem to have, 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 you've ticked so many boxes, you've achieved so much, but you still love this industry. It's great to see you light up when you talk about it. So what's uh, what's next for Alex? Are you chilling out now or are you still uh, working as hard as you as you were? No, I'm still enjoying my, my work. Um, there's always something new around the corner. Um, I've got a couple of discussions about, I want to do something new at the King's Arms in Christchurch. Um, yeah, I'm doing a bit more festival work now. Um, I think the demonstrations are waning a little bit, actually. Um, uh, I think people want to do more hands-on. Uh, would I do a cookery school? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know there's, there's, there's still a lot to come out of Alex. I'm not sure qu- quite what at the moment or maybe I don't want to tell anyone <laughs> but no, no I've definitely got I, all, I always feel I've got another dimension to get to go to to get into excellent yeah well that's good for the town so I'll be fascinated to watch where do people go to find out more uh, where do they go to, to, to book a table and come and eat or where do they go just to keep track of what Alex is doing next uh, well you've got Chef Alex Aiken on Instagram or is it Alex Aiken Chef one of those I'll, will put, find me. I'll put it in the show notes <laughs> <laughs> um um, Dine at the Jetty um, is where the Jetty is. Um, Christchurch Harbour Hotel is Christchurch Harbour Hotel or harbourhotels.co.uk. If you go to the harbourhotels.co.uk, it's a massive site because we have grown quite large. Um, I'm specifically in Southampton and Christchurch more than anywhere else, but you can follow it through. Just Google. <laughs> yeah, Google. It's magic. It, it, it will find you wherever yeah. you are. Uh, brilliant. Well, look, it's uh, yeah, fascinating to hear your career. I'm still in awe of uh, yeah of, of, of your journey, and uh, yeah, look look forward to seeing what you do next. But thank you for sparing the time. Congratulations, and I just appreciate having such a great restaurant where I can come and eat. I need to come back. I've not been for a little while. You've inspired me that I'll be back very soon. But thank you, Alex, for taking the time. You're very kind. Most enjoyable. Thank you, Mark. Cheers. So there you have it. You have reached the end of another episode of the Humans of Hospitality podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Please go and visit our website, humansofhospitality.co.uk for the show notes and extra episodes and information. And whilst you're there, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter and to receive free materials all about the humans behind our incredible industry. Lastly, if you could subscribe, rate and review this podcast, you will be massively helping me out and it would be hugely appreciated. Thank you so much. We'll be launching another podcast in just seven days time. Cheers. Cheers.